name is Sam Ritchie. Uh, I've modified the title of my talk a bit to make it more extreme sounding. Um, so we're gonna talk about closure, functional programming in physics and the preservation of society. Uh, I think society is in a fine place, but we're, very we're at the beginning of everything and uh, our methods of communication of ideas are not what they're going to be in 500 years. So this talk will be about one twitch of an attempt to start working on that problem. Um, okay, so I have to start with the grandiose framing and then we'll get into, into the weeds a little bit. Um, uh, a quick introduction to my name's Sam Ritchie. I've been in the closure world for a long time in various sub communities. I spent a lot of time doing large scale data streaming work. Um, I was the maintainer of Cascalog for a few years um, and have always loved this language and found it to be one of the best tools for me for thinking. It, it's something about this language just helps me work through ideas at the REPL. Um, so I'm, I'm a sucker for anything uh, closure related. Um, so uh, I've been working in this research lab in the last year and trying to get my, my physics ability up to speed. And I, I've come to a belief uh, that all is not well with scientific communication. Um, and by this, I mean the standard format of PDF publication that is really backwards compatible to the 1700s. Um, we have tools that allow us to communicate mathematical and scientific ideas. We have mathematical notation, uh, we have symbols, we have words, but they do okay, but you have to believe that there's something better that we'll get to. Um, so one, one take on this uh, is code for the serialization, serialization of ideas. Um, there's a lot of history here. Uh, this has been something people have attempted. It's not taken off terribly well. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into some reasons for that. Um, but I think that is just an accident of the time. I think people realized early on that code was a particularly unique vehicle for serializing scientific ideas. Um, as a taste of what I mean here, unlike mathematical notation, if I get something into code, it can communicate, it can also run itself and I can play with it and actually make this thing work. So there's this glimmer of something powerful that people realized back in the 40s um, when computers were coming online or Babbage even earlier than that. But it hasn't really played out. Um, I think it's time has come. I think we need to wake this idea up again. And I think Lisp and Clojure are a particularly amazing vehicle for the serialization of scientific ideas. Uh, and I'm gonna show you why I think this, both the trouble and the solution through uh, some detective work I went through over the past few months. Um, so here's Sussman. We just looked at his textbooks. Uh, <laughs> he's kind of gleefully nerdy uh, and is one of the best among us. He gave this talk, um, I forget which conference it was at, but uh, called Programming for the Expression of Ideas. And it's an amazing talk. He goes through examples from differential geometry and classical mechanics and physics. It's amazing because he shows these powerful ideas that uh, in fact, do encode the math he's talking about. So you can see that he's accomplished his goal, but the talk is like totally impenetrable. It's really, really hard because the ideas he has are from a culture that I certainly don't share, this culture of general relativists and <laughs> differential geometers. Um, so he's really existing between these cultures. He has these symbols that he says represent a thing, but he, can't he doesn't run them in the talk. And the people from those communities aren't familiar with the code. So um, still, I, this is in line with this character in the classic book, SICP, that maybe you all, uh, I can hold it up here. Um, you know, this, this wizard book, uh, there's this beautiful line, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Um, more of this belief in the air that code might be the way forward. Um, he has written a couple books that as an aspiring uh, physics student, I, I mean, again, like the bait had just piled up by this point. I'm a sucker for Lisp. I want to learn physics. He gives this talk. It's impenetrable. Here are the keys to the kingdom. Um, so I picked these books up and what's inside is a fascinating um, take on physics. Physics is presented here as like a software API. Uh, and this is a huge manual to the API of classical mechanics or differential geometry in the case of the second book. 
And the promise is if you get these books, if you understand the API, you've learned the subject. Um, and it's full of equations like this. There's math on the top. There's a, a Lisp rendering of what's on the bottom. Um, and it's beautiful, but it, it still remains kind of impenetrable. It was written in the 80s when you couldn't run this stuff. Um, so I took it on myself to learn uh, how this library worked and filter it through my brain and turn around and share it with people in a way that was more absorbable and runnable. Um, some of the barriers in the way of code as communication are, again, where do you run this line? How do you set your machine up? You know, what, all of these, these things that we're used to as software engineers are not okay if you just want to get across to a family member the beauty of these couple lines, um, which <laughs> it's, there's too little time to go into what this means here. So I'll leave you in the same state Sussman left me. Um, so uh, I took a stab at this book in the original scheme. I realized that the artifacts I was producing were going to be just as impenetrable to everybody else as, as they were to me originally. Um, so I found this work. Uh, this, this guy, Colin Smith, had taken on this her Herculean effort to port the book, uh, the library backing the book over into Clojure. And this is like a monumental effort. And I said, OK, we have Clojure here. I love this language. Um, Clojure has something that older languages don't, older Lisps don't. Clojure can compile to JavaScript, and JavaScript can run in the browser. So maybe this will solve my problem. If I can just take this library and port it over to ClojureScript, then I can take these things I'm learning, I can get them running in the browser, and I can just share links with people. And everybody's going to love physics. Physics is going to spread through the world. It's going to be amazing. Every, my my two-year-old is going to be talking about Lagrangians. Um, so. Uh, Let's see, I, I did this uh, and I found that I was lured, if, let's say the book cuts through classical mechanics and physics, uh, but of course physics builds on this immense amount of other work. Um, you've got comments in the book like this one here. Let, let's see what I can pick out from this. Uh, there's a piece of, of code that needs to rely on something called a minimizer. We've got a function, I just wanna find the, the point uh, the X point where the Y is, is minimal, um, or the, the input where the function will give me the lowest possible output value. And so you get this wall of words that I'm not expecting you all to understand. Like the minimizer is the Neldermead downhill simplex method. Uh, so the experience you get reading this book is that you're moving through like one path on a graph, this massive uh, graph of physics. And it's bewildering. Like you're, you're getting cut left and right with footnotes and references and things like this. And there's no one there to structure it for you. So Sussman has done this beautiful thing, but the more and more I read, the more and the more and more I tried to port, like I just kept having to pull in threads uh, that really weren't explained in this beautiful style that Sussman was claiming code is all about. Um, so I started digging into the library deeper and deeper into the guts to figure out, okay, the goal here is to embrace this idea of code as communication. Surely the code that backs the library will be beautiful artifacts of communication. Um, and I dug into the reference manual for that, uh, this thing called Brent's algorithm. It's a different minimizer than the one we just looked at. And I find quotes like this. You know, we personally like Brent's algorithm. Uh, it's pretty reliable and pretty fast, but we can't explain how it works. Um, so here we go. This is my first place where I can contribute to the, the field. I can embrace kind of code as communication. Um, so I dig into the code and I find this, um, which again, there's no need to understand what we're looking at here, but let me, let me paint for you. This is the beginning of my detective story. Um, so this is a minimizer for a single, you have a function. Uh, I'm gonna give A and B these kind of bounds. And within those bounds, I'd like you to find me the minimum value or the, the, uh, the point that will return the minimum value from the function. And really the code is not understandable. I mean, this, this here was written in 1987. Um, let's see if we can see my pointer. Uh, I stared at this for a long time. It's full of things like tall, too tall. Um, if you scroll farther down, we see these variables like P and Q and T1, T2, T3, T4. There's mutation going on, these cryptic comments. Um, so, okay, that's fine. Like not, not all code needs to be literate and amazing, but there, there's this, 
there's, I'm still hanging on to this promise that there's a beautiful way to present things with code. So I go, I go deeper. Um, I find this Python code from 2001. Uh, this is SciPy. And it looks, it's really similar. If I flip back and forth, like we've got T1 here. Uh, we've got temp1 here. Like this kind of looks like it's the same code, just ported uh, from different places. You see this comment, Sussman says, he took this from a book back in page 79 through 80 of this old textbook. Um, Python looks the same. Um, this here, let's see. Uh, this is C++. This is boost. Um, we've got effectively the same code with the same temp variables, the same kind of mutation magic happening. Uh, there's a little more color to these comments. We see, whew, parabolic fit here at the bottom. And nope, try golden section instead. So someone was kind of trying to absorb this. Like you can see someone tried to understand this and add comments and some information, but um, it, it's not, for me, this doesn't, this doesn't really teach me. It took a long time to decode what was happening here. Um, I got back to 1986. This is, uh, I believe, Fortran. This is in this book, Numerical Recipes. The code still looks the same. Um, we have slightly different variable names. And then finally, I bought the book. Uh, so we're back to 1973 now, and we find this Algol 60 code that has encoded this, you know, idea of a function minimizer that everyone finds so cryptic. Um, and it helps a bit more, but it's still cryptic. Um, but what I found is the text around the book was beautiful. There was this incredible description just in English of what all this stuff meant. Um, I'll sketch quickly how this works. We don't have too much time, but basically the idea is, okay, one way to find the minimum of the solid black curve, if points one and three are your edges, one way is just try a bunch of points, like randomly sample. Okay, that might work. Another way is to inch the sides in. That's pretty slow. Uh, a better way is to pick two points somewhere in the middle, kind of evenly spaced. Pick whichever one's lower. And whichever one's lower, just move the outside bound in a little bit um, to one of the new kind of left and right. So you're he says in the textbook, you're hunting down the minimum like a, a frightened rabbit on a, on a chase. Like it's bizarre phrasing, but it's colorful and amazing. And like, this is how humans actually talk. Um, so his method is a way of every once in a while injecting these steps where you fit a parabola to three of the points and attempt to just leap directly to the bottom. And if the function's smooth enough or kind of looks like a parabola, that's going to get you a lot farther. And there's a couple conditions for just cutting off the jump. Um, so I took a stab at converting this. This isn't, I, I still wasn't on this like bandwagon I'll get to about code as really amazing communication. So I, I took a stab at it. I filtered it. I have a lot of great comments. Like what I produced is better. It's a lot more understandable than when it came before, but it's not, it's not great yet. It's still source code and someone's still going to copy it. And it's not going to, it's not going to do the job of, of code as communication. Um, so I came out of this, I mean, kind of bummed out. Like, Code is communication. What seems to be happening though is people serialize their ideas into code and because the code can run the idea, the whole literate side of things, the fact that this is communication, you don't have to bring that along for the ride. So the code turns into this alien thing, this like black box artifact that works, but uh, is not really available for introspection. And I think what these fields, what's so beautiful about these fields is that they can teach us how they work. And the ideas here are quite simple, this jumping to the bottom and, and hunting like a, like a scared rabbit. Um, and when you get them, they, they teach you new ways of looking at the world that you can branch out from. So I left a little discouraged, um, uh, but hopeful about the larger program. Um, okay, so another example of this sort of thing, you go another page later, uh, and I was baited again by, okay, the definite integral function. SCM utils includes a variety of numerical integration procedures um, with buzzwords all through. And this is just a tool you need to do the physics. Uh, it's not addressed in its own way as something really powerful. Um, so I got baited again. Uh, we'll skim through this next thing because this absorbed much more time. This is much, much harder. Um, but at this point, I was, I was kind of a, like a warrior. I became a spiritual warrior for code should be able to communicate itself well. And I know it's possible. And I, I want to figure out how to do a better job of this. Uh, so I found 
again, just a beautiful paper by Sussman again, where he goes through this idea of definite integrals. I'll, I'll, I'll say what this is in the next page. Um, and sketches out this amazing functional lispy approach to this. It's incredible. Like using the streams API, you get this thing that where the ideas are so clear. Um, but it's not because he didn't have to. This paper is not baked into the library that has survived. Um, so I guess very shortly, the idea here of a definite integral is I want to find the area under some curve. I can do this by chopping this, the area up, the x-axis up into rectangles, and picking some point on the curve to anchor the heights of the rectangles to, and then adding all these up. And I can go subdivide and take more and more rectangles. And the more rectangles I take, the more accurate I'm going to be. Um, so, I mean, fast forward through a month of my life. Um, it's kicked off an incredible detective hunt where I, I took Sussman's paper. I went a lot farther with it. Uh, I, I, I mean, I can't show all these Wikipedia references, just, just sort of cryptic things that were out there um, describing little hints of how things were related. Um, it turns out that all these ideas uh, really are linked by this one simple idea of a, a, a tableau, let's call it. So again, like I, I may be committing the same sin that Sussman did, but let me sketch out for you quickly just this unifying idea. The idea is these indices here refer to guesses at the integral. So the integral here, let's say one guess is I cut this curve into two or four blocks, just like in the blue. That would be my first guess. My second guess, I cut into eight blocks. Let's say I, cu I cut the um, size of the block in half. So it takes eight to fill up the range. I go 16, I go 32. Each doubling is going to get me a better estimate. There's this beautiful thing you can do where if you take those estimates, if they, they don't have to cut in half, like I said, but if they just get a little better each time, uh, you can make this tableau. And what the tableau is, is uh, P0 would be the, the first thing. P0 and 1 is I'm going to fit a line between the estimates for my first two values. So a polynomial with two points. P012 is I'm going to fit a cubic between those three. P0123, I'm going to fit a quartic and so on. And if your, if your values that you're putting into this function of the estimate, like the width of the, the cell, get smaller and smaller, it turns out if you fit a, a curve to them, you can do this magical trick where you just say, what would happen if the width was zero? You can just extrapolate forward and you'll get a pretty good estimate. This is called the sequence acceleration method. Um, so he, he, he shows this in the paper with a very specialized thing called Richardson extrapolation. Um, it turns out there's like all sorts of extrapolation methods that fit this tableau. So if you get them into this form, then what happens is all these Wikipedia articles, there's all these methods for definite integrals. There's Simpson's method, there's Simpson's 3 eighths method, there's Milne's method, Boole's rule, uh, let's keep going, Romberg acceleration, the midpoint method, the trapezoid method. And they are all just this idea. Uh, the Milne, Simpson, Simpson 3 eighths, they're just columns of this tableau. So what that means is as I go from P01 to P12 and so on, I'm getting successively better uh, accelerated estimates. Remember, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is my take four slices, take eight slices, take 16. So if you go down the first column, you get the trapezoid method. If you go down the second column, you get uh, one level of acceleration of the trapezoid method. That's called Simpson's method. Um, and what that means visually, geometrically, is instead of fitting like a, a flat little, um, uh, instead of fitting a trapezoid, which is a, a line, you fit a quadratic. And Simpson's 3 eighths is a little better. And then um, Boole, I think, is the next one. It's the second column here. Uh, I, I'm going to get the, yeah, yeah, Boole's the second column here, and so on. So uh, Romberg integration, this other thing you find is just the first row of this. Um, and so all this knowledge that collapses to these, these simple little ideas. Um, and what we have here is at the end of my like big journey for this, and at the end of Sussman's paper in a small level, um, the goal I had was to create sort of a workbench where the workbench is covered in little tools, and the tools can combine in powerful ways. We're already all sold on that from the Lisp enclosure world. Um, but these are the tools of 
numerical methods in physics and science. And the thing I wanted to add was that the tools should be able to tell you how they work and explain themselves in a way that is like intimately tied to their implementation. Uh, here, physics happens to be this area full of beautiful, like visually representable things. Um, so I'm not quite there yet with this work, but the goal here is to have each of these methods just as you scroll through these successively better estimates down one of the columns across, just show you what they're doing and teach you. Um, and so I'll say more about that in a moment. But um, you know, the beauty of breaking stuff into, into components is, I mean, there's no name for the fourth column. You know, I wonder, is that, uh, it's Jordan's method? Who knows? Like, there's no name for, another obvious idea is, what if I go across a row, and then when I hit something pretty good, like once I hit my first four points, I go down. Like, these ways of just walking around like you're cruising around a maze. There's reasons you can't go too far right. Um, but it's all just so obvious to play with. It's incredibly difficult with the original Fortran implementations to play like this. Like, I can go write this at the REPL now and just mess around. Um, but the original stuff is very, very tightly hard coded in the name of performance. Um, but performance is really, really good now, just out of the box. And so I think we need to ditch this idea a little bit and really package our ideas in a way where they have their own life support systems. Um, so this got really turbo. Like I effectively wrote a book on functional numerical methods. Uh, the book like is the source code library. Um, it can't animate itself yet. It's still a separate thing from the code. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about why, what, what to do next about that. Um, okay, so I think it's like really messed up and troubling that I had to do this. Uh, and the reason why is code really is its own communication vehicle. Um, but someone else had already figured this workout and serialized it into code. And following this trail was possible, I think, it was easier than just following math and just following, there's a lot more culture associated with mathematical notation. It was easier, um, but there's no incentive to do the work to really package things in a way where the ideas can live on their own. Um, and I was just struck by the sense as I did this work that there's very few people that really understand how a lot of these core numerical methods that a lot of our physics runs on um, are implemented. And, it's an even bigger story with a full computer algebra system, like what Sussman's built underneath these two textbooks. There are very few of these. They're not explained well. And uh, the most recent work on them is decades ago, but we still rely on them for all our work. So, okay. Jonathan Blow gave this talk called Preventing the Collapse of Civilization. <laughs> uh, he, again, he is the one who pushed me to take this far. His, his talk is about how... Uh, you can look at many complex societies in the past that just get to a stage where things are just a little hard to do. It's a little hard to build the canals. We forget how to do it. And that knowledge really, knowledge does not keep itself alive. Uh, up till now, and it's been better, of course, in the past century, but this knowledge of physics and numerical methods, these are things we keep alive as a culture by communicating them. We're still almost in like an oral society where if we were to stop teaching this stuff for a decade or two decades. The question is, could it bring itself back to life? Um, I think it could, but it would take far more work than it needed to. And, and only because we have machines that can run the executable implementations of things that we've tried to get locked down so far. Um, so I think I still believe in code as communication more than ever. Uh, the reason why now is a particularly amazing time for this is that code in the past, in Sussman's pitch in the 80s, was just an alternate communication vehicle that you could execute on a machine. But in 2020, the code can, like, code can show itself in these incredible visual environments. JavaScript has just off the charts, unbelievable uh, you know, rendering engines. Um, there's 3D animation libraries everywhere that are just begging for physics. Like, I think we have this chance to sew in a lot of our scientific knowledge, like rather than emitting these things as PDFs that are about humans talking to other humans that could have lived 300 years ago. I think we need to be in a world more where we focus on emitting ideas in a form where they have their own life support. These things need to make it across time. And we don't need to last forever, but they need to have a longer half-life so that while we figure out how to talk to each other about this stuff, and how to encode things for a long term, 
the ideas can explain themselves when we do cover them again. Um, so I think Lisp enclosure, just in closing, like a little hint of the stuff I'm working on. Um, Lisp enclosure is super powerful here. Uh, this is like an impenetrable physics thing written in Lisp. Totally works, but understanding this is still really hard. Um, it's a little easier when you realize that Lisp can generate its own other representations. So we can have Lisp showing off math. Um, what's even more powerful is the Lisp generating math, but also powering a simulation like this. Like, this is actually what this code means. These are the equations to go tick time forward in this thing. Um, and this right now looks, this is like a setup you have now with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, what Lisp and Clojure give us through this unique ability to run on JavaScript and the JVM is I can have a software package that when I open a browser page, this is all just happening. Other pages can depend on these elements here, like code elements in one page is another, just a dependency as if it was in the library. Uh, we have a base here in our language we all love where we can build something closer to Wikipedia, but full of executable, beautiful things um, that know how to both explain themselves and run themselves and represent themselves in a way that is shareable and is not just trapped in particular notebooks. Um, so uh, I'm working on this project called the Dynamics Notebook Project. Like we're trying to modify this, uh, this website you may know called maria.cloud to host all of the stuff that makes those books work. Um, it works now. We're going to try to get it out in the next couple of weeks, actually running so that you can play with some of these ideas. Um, but again, this, this metaphor of the metaphor I'm aiming at here is imagine that when you go to learn something or you're exploring physics of these textbooks, you're in a workshop full of tools, beautiful planes or things like this. These tools are hundreds of years old. A lot of this stuff is settled as far as the ideas go. Uh, but when you pick one of these things up, it can teach you about itself, tell you about its history, tell you how to use it, um, or you can ignore all that and just get to work. Um, so I think that's that's my my pitch now is, yes, literate programming has had a lot of trouble in the past. Um, yes, not everything needs this sort of archival treatment. Um, but I think we need to invest in tools that will allow our ideas serialized as code to bring their own life support systems along. Um, so uh, yeah, we hang out in the Zulip or the Clojurians channel. Um, this works pretty young, but, uh, and we didn't have much of a chance to cover like actual physics examples here. So if you're curious about this and if this has sparked anything in you, like please come chat and write me. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>